Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to talk with you today about building a satellite lab in applied chemical ecology. For many of us, when we hear the term satellite, we might think about an artificial body placed in orbit around a celestial body. But an alternate definition is an organization or place that depends on another. Using this definition, we could define a satellite lab then as one that depends on the existence of another lab. In this sense, satellite labs are a hybrid form of international partnership. They're smaller, more focused, and less bureaucratic than a formal alliance between institutions, but they are broader and more structured than an agreement between like-minded individuals as shown here on the right. What are the advantages of a satellite lab? Or to put it another way, why bother? For the scientists involved in the satellite lab outside of their home institution, it's a mechanism for expanding their research program. And for the host institution, it's an, a mechanism whereby they can add capacity in a targeted discipline. In the case of chemical ecology, this is a particularly complicated endeavor, much more so than for many disciplines. Chemical ecology, or the reason being, is that chemical ecology is not an autonomous discipline, but rather an approach to ecology, one of viewing ecological interactions through a chemical lens. To do chemical ecology well requires capacity in multiple complementary disciplines, as illustrated in this Venn diagram. So in and of themselves, these benefits, that of increasing the research program of an individual and capacity of the organization, would seem to be justification enough for building a satellite lab. But I don't think they're, they are the, the entirety of the benefits. I think the real benefit of a satellite lab is that it facilitates the development of relationships and alliances globally. And I think this is significant because the majority of the problems that we face in terms of forest health are by their very nature international and therefore require international solutions. This is illustrated by this figure here and there's two points I'd like to make. One is that the forest health problems are whatever geopolitical entity you might pick, be it South Africa, Canada, or Australia, cannot and will are normally not solved by researchers working in that country in isolation. Rather, our forests are connected and therefore our research programs need to be connected. And the second is that the phenomenon of recurrent or multiple and bridgehead introductions is not the exception, but rather the rule. Typically, satellite labs develop because a host institution makes the decision that it wants to develop capacity in a discipline and therefore they recruit someone to develop and then lead that satellite lab. The satellite lab that we're talking about today differs from this model in two significant ways. The first is that the satellite lab emerged out of a relationship between individuals. That relationship started with myself and Bernard Slippers but quickly grew to involve multiple individuals, both at FABI and in the Canadian Forest Service. The second is that the direction of the export of capacity has been and continues to be bi-directional, with students, postdocs, in faculty traveling in both directions and bringing with them not only technologies, but ideas that enrich the research programs of both institutions. In my view, this satellite lab is truly reciprocal and that reciprocity, I think, is significant because it, in my mind, makes the potential impact and longevity of this relationship dramatically more than that of a traditional satellite lab. I don't have time to go through all the people involved in the satellite lab and in fact, there's more people than are shown in this slide. But the point I'd like to make is that this is a, a becoming a very large um, interaction um, supporting the, the work of multiple people at both FABI and the Canadian Forest Service. With the time I have left, I'd like to give you a bit of an insight into some of the work that, that I'm talking about with these individuals. And two of the projects I'm going to cover are, one is a biological control program for an invasive plant in Canada and can, the role of chemical ecology in developing post-release monitoring tools. And the other is uh, one looking at trap active space and survey detection work. <clears throat> Dog strangling vine is an invasive plant in the United States and Canada. It forms um, dense um, mats or stand in, in, in our forested stand, sorry. 
and these um, dense mats crowd out native uh, plants and young trees and this can uh, interfere with regeneration of stands post harvest these dense interwoven mats um, interfere with forest management activities and uh, recreation activities the plant is in the milkweed family so the leaves and roots can be toxic and native herbivores often avoid it, which increases grazing pressure on um, palatable native plants. And many of these native plants are protected or threatened. And the monarch butterfly shown here in the bottom uh, insert photo is a species at risk in Ontario and it is threatened by the dog strangling vine. And the, the problem here is that because the, the plant is similar to the natural host plant of the monarch butterfly, Females oviposit on dog strangling vine, but larvae aren't able to complete their development and so they die. Numerous biological control agents have been examined for release in Canada and the United States. Uh, one that has received approval for release and, and has actively been released for many for several years now is Hypena opulenta. This moth um, is very host specific. Upwards of 23,000 individuals have been released in two sites predominantly in Ontario. And <laughs> the problem or one of the, the problems limiting the, 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 the efficacy of this program in Canada is that we're unable to assess the, the factors that influence the success of releases. And so in order to do that, we need to be able to sample for the presence of um, larvae or adults post-release and right now we don't have good tools to do that so so op individuals working in this uh, are these programs liken this process to searching for a needle in a haystack so field crews go out they look for evidence of larvae or larval feeding damage at sites and because of the geographic the, the size of the area infested by the plant th this really is a daunting task and labor intensive. So what they, what we would like to be able to offer them is a pheromone for the adults and we'd, they'd be able to then put out traps and with limited effort and costs, sample large areas for establishment and spread of the, the moth post-release. This is our role in the project. The project involved uh, Mark Boer as a postdoc visiting my lab um, over the course of several years. And um, in addition to, you know, showing you here that, you, you know, this is a GCAD and some GCMS trace showing that we've got three putative compounds that Mark was able to identify. It makes another point that I'd like to, to make here. And that is that not only does the Satellite Lab connect research programs at both the um, Canadian Forest Service and FABI at the University of Pretoria, but it also connects our networks. And through these, this relationship, Mark was able to work with Peter Mayo, who's shown in the top right photo there, a uh, synthetic chemist with the Canadian Forest Service in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Peter is synthesizing these compounds, and he worked with Jocelyn Miller at the University of California in Riverside, who is a collaborator um, um, with me at the Canadian Forest Service to identify these compounds. The second project I would like to talk about is some work we've done looking at trap active space and survey detection uh, for non-native species predominantly, but also for native pests in our forests. And when we think about trap active space, that, that term refers to the area downwind of a odor baited trap where the concentration of the odorant is above the threshold required to induce upwind flight towards the point source. How do we measure trap active space? Well, in the past, the way this has been done is predominantly two ways. So one, you see this, this um, hexagon of triangles in the insert in the bottom right, we put out arrays of traps and, and the one design is to use a hexagon. There are other designs, but essentially you look at, as you change the distance between traps in the array, you look at the effect of that spacing on the relationship of capture in the perimeter to the center trap. And from that, you can infer um, the trap active space. The other approach is to use the fact that when male moths smell pheromone, they begin to wing fan and move in a characteristic way as shown in this photo with silk moths here. And so the, the figure on the left shows that you can increase the active space by increasing the amount of odorant that you release from a trap or the ratio of components of the odorant that you release from a trap. Both of these approaches are labor intensive and they only really give you one piece of information. That is how far from the trap 
um, how, what is the size of the active space. The approach we've taken is to work with folks in New Zealand who have developed this device shown here, which is a mobile EAG. And certainly they're not the first to, first to have done so, but what is special or unique about this device is that how small it is and how light it is. So it is small enough that it can be carried around by hand and so you can move around in space and begin to get an idea of how odor plumes change in space and time and how far away from a point source a moth can detect the pheromone. And here you can see the moth in the insert in the bottom left. It, it, they are live in the mount and so it, that has several advantages for the preparation or for the, the tool. This figure here shows just that not only is this device quite small and handheld, but it is as sensitive as the lab-based version. So it really is a remarkable tool with an incredible opportunity, offering incredible, incredible opportunities, sorry, to explore um, active spaces and, and how trap design and stand structure, for example, might influence trap active space. So here you can see um, a pine stand in South Africa that's been defoliated by Euproctis. Um, and shown in the upper right is a PhD student who recently joined my group. And Joel has received training from the folks in Scion on how to use this device, the mobile EAG, and will be using it as part of his PhD. But what he doesn't know yet is that Joel will have the bright idea of taking advantage of the fact that Euproctis is day active so that you can um, easily collect data that are not easily available with most species that are nocturnal, and that we now know the sex pheromone of this species. And of course, you'll have my full support to do that. I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them.